Today is about breaking barriers, so as you can see, I'm not wearing a dark jacket. So that was the first barrier I decided to break. I also was told that we have 20 minutes for this. So as a Middle Eastern, I negotiated and I managed to get 23 minutes, which uh, is uh, not uh, enough actually for what I want to tell you. So I'll probably be speaking very fast, but I hope you will get, you will get my point because it's actually more about a mindset that I want you to change today if you really want to break the barriers. Uh, and that mindset is, uh, is simple to, to, uh, to build if you actually see the truth. And so the title of my presentation is The Age of Sci-Fi. And I want to try to tell you that as you and all of us were blinking in the last 10 years, the world has changed so drastically that dealing with the world the way we dealt with it 10 years ago would actually not be suitable at all. And so, uh, to start, I want to ask, you know, to, to, to promise you this. I will deliver to you five charts. Two of them you know, but three will be quite eye-opening. Uh, uh, you know, five technologies that I really think you should be paying a lot of attention to. Uh, three mindsets, if you want, that will hopefully help you, you know, break the barriers, but also one big mission at the end, which is the reason why I negotiated for the three extra minutes. So, um, how many of you have used one of these before? I can't see all, oh, so many, right. So remember that thing, you know, you had to turn the dial and, you know, if you had a friend that had a zero in their number, you would hate them because zeros are so difficult. Remember that, right? And that, that was in one lifetime. Hmm? Uh, all of us today have smartphones that connect to the internet and do so many amazing things. And when the battery life of the phone doesn't last for a full day, we start to complain. It's like, ah, come on. You know, that phone has more in it today than what NASA uh, had in the, uh, in the, you know, the um, um, rocket that landed on the moon. And we sort of try to, we sort of tend to forget what's happening because of how fast it's happening. I don't know how many of you have seen the recent Google announcement about Google Assistant calling people, uh, a machine, an artificially intelligent machine, calling people on the phone and having full conversation. So I'll show you that quickly. Uh, the person on the right is a, on, on this side is a machine. The person on that side Hi. is a human. I'm to book a woman's haircut for our clients. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Did you hear that? That's a machine. Sure. What time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. So this is not a demo. It's not a science fiction movie. This is actually artificial intelligence doing that job and call, calling small businesses for you. Uh, so Google announced that they will do this only uh, to find out opening times for now, but then you know, in the future they will allow all of us to use it as part of Google Assistant. And that's part of what is part of our life today. Okay? This is how we live every day, and we take that for granted. Now, I want you to take a look at this. If you re review anything you've seen today, anything that you came across since the morning, and ask yourself, if I had told my grandmother that this was going to be my life 50 years from now, would she have believed you? What would she have said if, she, said if, she, if you told her that you're going to have maps that talk to you and give you directions, if, they, if you told her that you know, there is uh, um, um, you know, um, machines uh, for fitness that measure everything for you, Google search, video conferencing, all of that stuff, she would have said this was science fiction. And the problem is that science fiction is becoming science fact. Why? Because technology is moving so fast that it's becoming difficult to keep up with what's happening. Why is technology moving so fast? Because of those curves I, I wanted to share with you. The first one is very well known. We call that the S-curve, the, the product adoption curve, if you want. And the product adoption curve is that from the time we launch a product to, you know, it first starts slowly and then it really, really ramps up quickly and then it plateaus and they say you have to build another product, another S, if you want to have your uh, business successful. And if you take any of the technologies that you uh, uh, are used to, 
you know, in this case, for example, I would like to compare the TV and the internet. If you compare the TV and the internet, you would notice that the kind of penetration that the internet achieved in 15 years would ach was achieved by the TV in 100 years. It was achieved by the printing press, if you want, uh, uh, actually never. And sometimes I joke about that, and I say that it took Jesus somewhere around 2,000 years to reach 2 billion people. Uh, it took uh, Larry Page around seven years, right? It, and, and reality is, with technology, we're now propagating so quickly that life cycles of products, you know, in the past cars were made every seven years, would probably not last uh, as a, a way of making things anymore. That technology, that, that product adoption curve is, become, is a result of something that is really amazing in technology, okay? Uh, which is uh, what's normally known as the technology acceleration curve. If you, you know, technology acceleration curve is not only limited to information technology. If you look at something like automobiles, for example, this is uh, Auto Union, the original, you know, uh, original company that became Audi. This car in the 60s and 70s had 50 horsepower. Uh, you know, the uh, famous Quattro had around 200 to 300 horsepower. The R8 today has something like 560. The Bugatti Veyron is 1,200 horsepower. And, you know, Bugatti now has one that is 1,500 horsepower. And that continues to grow. And that kind of acceleration is what we do in technology. You know, this is how it looks like in cars. But if any of you have ever used a Sinclair, a Commodore, a, an IBM-compatible uh, DOS computer, you would realize that this is actually much, much, much steeper when it comes to information technology. So you take something like, uh, you know, the microprocessor, and you would see a curve that looks more like this. More, more than a million X. That's the kind of growth that you get on the original uh, uh, processor that we had. And, the, and when, you prob when you put s this kind of growth into something that is helping us develop more technology, so you know, when you have a faster engine, you can only move the car faster. But when you have a faster processor, you can actually use all, you know, CAD design software and all of the um, you know, compute power to research and make computers that are even faster. And so this self-fulfilling cycle is leading us to uh, what is known as Moore's Law, which is technology advances uh, almost doubles every 18 months at the same cost. And Moore's Law has held true since the day it came out. Some people will say it's now going to slow down a little bit. Yeah, it will slow down a little bit. The way we do computing is changing, so cloud computing and quantum computing will open the, the, you know, the door for, for new ways of, uh, of continuing to grow the processing power. Now, this is one side. Uh, um, you know, the other side that this has enabled, and especially 1995 with the, you know, the real uh, um, um, presence of the internet, is that everyone can innovate. And so we may not see this clearly, but if you compare the world back 15 to 20 years where, informa when, where, where information and knowledge was limited to just a few of us, to the world today where there is an information democracy, uh, that is really, really staggering. When you think about it, uh, you know, a child in India today has the same access to knowledge as an MIT student, which was not the case before the internet. They also have access to tools, such as the tools that Google uses to develop their systems. As a matter of fact, with, you know, with cloud computing, you could probably borrow Google's tools to develop your own technology anywhere you want. Right? You, can develop, you can borrow the most advanced technologies, including artificial intelligence, uh, from Google and Amazon and so on. And once you build something, you have the whole world as your market. So, you know, in the past you would make a shoe and you're limited to sell it to your neighbors. Now you can make an app in Ukraine and sell it all over the world. And that's, that is basically what, what is accelerating technology to, to the point where today it's almost hard to keep up. It is not unlikely that there will be uh, some kind of a, a technology developed in the next couple of years that will reach a billion users within its first years, year of use. And, and it's, it's very, very possible that we will see that many times. The curve that matters most is this one. Most people will see the technology adoption curve and the product adoption curve after a product is released or, ap after, a product is ac or after a technology is ready for use. What people don't see is what happens to technology until it becomes ready for use. And if you have a foresight into what technologies are coming next, 
it would actually make a big difference. And this is what I call the technology uh, um, uh, development curve, which basically starts with a lot of work that uh, you know, gets you to, um, through momentum and a breakout point to accelerate very, very quickly the use of that technology. That breakout point is normally when you find the breakthrough. Okay? The thing about this curve is it actually looks more like this. You know, most of us don't realize how long it takes, unless you're actually in the lab, how long it takes for a technology to actually become, uh, uh, um, to, to cross that breakout point. So this example is from artificial intelligence, which I know is the buzzword that everyone here talks about all the time. But artificial intelligence is nothing new. We started to talk about artificial intelligence in the 50s. 1954 was the Dartmouth experiment or the Dartmouth workshop where you know, computer scientists started to say, hey, this is something we really need to focus on. And as we did that, uh, you know, basically until the 70s, 1973, everyone invested in, uh, the, uh, in AI until in 1973 the economics you know, situation led to the first AI winter. Uh, Japan tried again in the 80s, so everyone joined in 1987 was the second AI winter. And all of those may be 50 years until the turn of the century, when we started to discover things like unprompted AI, uh, deep learning and neural networks and so on. That was the time that we started to really break out. Okay? The current commercial use of AI is driving so many people to invest in it that it is no longer a matter of whether or not we will have artificial intelligence. It's more a matter of when and how big and how fast and how intelligent it will be. So you put that curve uh, uh, on the current technology arena and you would see that there are five technologies you need to pay attention to. Uh, one is robotics, and ro robots are not uh, th what we see in the movies. They're not humanoids, and they're not the machines that Toyota uses to make cars. Robots are machines with intelligence that are able to make decisions. So basically, it's AI with a hardware component. Machine learning and AI, as I told you, is really breaking out. I'll come back to this at the end of the presentation. This is an interesting one that most of us don't think about. It's called life sciences, which basically is the intersection between biology and computer science. And you'll be surprised how much we humans are actually predictable as a machine. And so the more we measure that machine and understand how it works, the more it becomes a computer science. Uh, um, a virtual and augmented reality, even though when we started you know, we uh, tried to position that as, in, as an entertainment and gaming device. Uh, it's, you know, it didn't find that big ma of a market, but now as it's coming into the enterprise, into training and you know, uh, um, uh, assistance and so on and so forth, uh, it's definitely break out, breaking out. And then finally, the blockchain, which if you're in the finance industry, you would realize this is very, very serious. To remove the middleman, in most industries, as a matter of fact, to remove the middleman through an open ledger that allows trust is a massive, massive technology. Now, put all of these together, give them the technology acceleration curve, and you would realize that what's coming next truly is science fiction. It truly is. And so I'll, I'll, I'll test your uh, uh, you know, openness and mind, um, open-mindedness about this by showing you some of the or original science fiction movies to just show you how far we've come. This is Star Trek, 1960s. Uh, everything that you see here, the flip phone, the tablet, everything in Star Trek we've, we have, has become science fact. You would agree. Um, this is uh, a Minority Report, 2004, if you remember that movie. Uh, you know, uh, Tom Cruise started to wave at, at his computer and share, you know, the, the, the computer would understand the gestures and I was at Microsoft at the time and I said, wow, that is so science fiction. Six years later, it was on every Xbox and every PlayStation. Uh, this is 2007, iRobot, and many other movies, science fiction movies, predicted self-driving cars. I think you realize that self-driving cars are part of what we live every day today. I mean, they're not on the streets yet, but they've driven millions of miles safely using a computer. Now, let's push it a little. This is, again, from Star Trek, uh, the video in the middle here. Uh, as you can see, it's sort of generating out of nothing at all a, a glass of water. Okay? Uh, so do you think that will happen in your lifetime and mine? Raise your hand. I can't see all hands. Very few hands. Okay, the mindset hasn't changed. Let me just tell you uh, that this has happened already many years ago. 
uh, through something called 3D printing. You just don't think of it that way because it's still not printing the glass alone and the water alone. But there is no doubt that in your lifetime and mine, we will be printing many, many things that are made of composite materials and different materials at the same time. Let me push it a little further. The one on the left is telepathy. Telepathy is for me to be able to read your mind without the use of words. How many of you will think, will think this will happen in your lifetime and mine? Oh, there we go. Now we're getting ha some hands. By the way, those who are not raising their hands, it's a trick question. I'm actually trying to tell you it will happen. Okay, um, so, uh, so telepathy has already happened. My daughter lives in Montreal. I talk to her all the time through a quick format that's called WhatsApp. And, you know, uh, it's through a screen and a keyboard, which will definitely be removed from our life within the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, things like teleportation, time travel, or even the movie Avatar are all possible in virtual reality. If you, know, if you don't think they will happen in your lifetime and mine, you better use a, a virtual reality headset to see how far we can go with this. It's not unlikely that in the future you will swipe through and say, I want to go to Tokyo in 1920. Not that difficult at all. Having said that, it's all a mindset. And as you can see, even as I tell you that everything is possible, we still resist the idea that we can actually change. Similarly to how my you know, fellow pharaohs 7,000 years ago resisted the idea that instead of carrying seven ton bricks up a, a, a mountain to create a pyramid, they could wait a little and have those broken down into 50 pound bags. You know, cement is a technology where you can mix water and make the rocks up there. Uh, that happened, uh, the, the pharaoh would have refused to believe that he need to needs to stop adding more horses to the cart and instead wait for Bugatti to give him 1,200 horses in a small machine, right? That mindset is what I need, what, one of the things we need to change. The mindset that things cannot happen in the future, the reality is that almost everything you've ever seen in, in science fiction will happen in your lifetime and mine in one form or another. This is what led us to what we called moonshot thinking at Google X. Moonshot thinking is to, to look at a problem and tell yourself, if everything was possible, how would I solve that problem? Would I solve it differently? And basically, if you look at the auto industry, for example, we tried to make the car safer for 100 years. How did we do that? First crash worthiness, as we used to call it, airbags and crumbled zones and so on, followed by crash uh, avoidance, you know, xeno, xeon lights and ABS and what have you, to make the crash less likely. Then, if you were actually given the technology that we have today, you would start to stop, you would start to avoid crashes altogether. And the reason for, for accidents is human error. 90% of accidents happen as a result of human error, and accordingly, something that, is, that has driver assistance or self-driving in it is the right answer to actually not have an accident at all. This is what we call a moonshot. A moonshot is to think of a big problem and solve it in a way that is very, very different than the way we've solved problems in the past. And so, with that kind of thinking, I told you I want you to change three things that will really, really get you to break the barriers. And those three things are the following. Whatever your business in, is, I ask you to remember that everything's possible. Anything that you can even dream of is doable in your business today. Okay? And if you think that way, suddenly you would stop trying to incrementally improve your products. Instead, you would actually start to commit to the problem. And you'll be amazed. So Google X's uh, guideline was that we will only work on problems that affect the lives of a billion people or more. Believe it or not, I used to get three a week. Our world is full of problems, yet some of us are still focusing all of their innovative power on uh, designing a thinner LED screen or a fancier telephone, when there are so many problems that our world needs to solve. Larry Page taught us to call this the toothbrush problem. The toothbrush problem is, if you manage to find a solution to a problem that affects billions of people, and it works really well, so they use it twice a day, you're bound to make a lot of money. And that kind of thinking of, I'm going to focus on the problem, not on the product, not on the technology, not on the legacy, is something that I really encourage you to think about. And the third is this, don't accept incremental innovation anymore. Okay? Incremental innovation is to take your current product and try to make it a little bit better. 
Radical innovation is to say anything less than 10x, tenfold improvement in the product performance is not worth it. And when you do it that way, suddenly you start to solve problems differently in line of the age that we're living in. The age that we're living in is telling you be radical because everything is possible. Put all of those together and you can implement this everywhere. I actually uh, you know, help companies around the world from airlines to finance to anything that you can think of to actually implement moonshot thinking uh, you know, in their companies to try and, um, and, uh, and, and, and make that their lifestyle. The operational challenge, of course, is big. I'm not going to go into the details of that uh, slide if you want to take a picture of it or we can talk about it offline. Uh, but it really is a very, very different uh, approach to be innovative, but at the same time be factory-like in terms of being predictable. Uh, uh, but it is doable, and there are many companies around the world adopting that thinking. Which leaves me to perhaps my uh, personal moonshot. And so the ethical challenge of all of this is actually beyond our imagination. And very few of us step back and think about how all of this technology is going to change our life. And so, and so I decided to leave Google in, uh, in March this year to be able to openly talk about this. So I'll show you a quick video, and then perhaps we can discuss it further in the uh, Q&A. How do we contain them? We don't contain them at all. The best way to raise wonderful children is to be a wonderful parent. It's not the inventor of the technology that's going to set the tone going forward. It's the technology itself that's going to use the knowledge, the values that we communicate to it, to develop its own intelligence. How are those machines learning? They're looking at all of the knowledge that's out there in the world, and they're building patterns from that just like an 18-month-old infant. Remember when we gave our children those little boxes that had different patterns and shapes? That's the way computers are learning today. We basically write algorithms that allow computers to understand those patterns, and then we get them to try and try and try, and through pattern recognition, through billions of observations, they learn. They're learning by observing. And what are they observing? They're observing a world that's full of greed, disregard for other species, violence, ego, showing off. The only way to get those machines to be not only intelligent, but to also have the right value set, is that we start to portray that right value set today. The problem is unhappiness. Unhappiness has never been higher one of every four people in the world today is clinically depressed. Teen suicide is at an all-time high. Humanity has never had a better life. Our life expectancy is better, our quality of life is better, but we've never been unhappier. My personal moonshot is about making a billion people happy. Billion with a B. <laughs> your happiness is your priority. Invest in your happiness and then find the compassion in you to share it. Pay it forward. Tell others. If every one of us tells two people who tell two people who tell two people, that is the absolute design of an exponential function. I'm going to tell the world that my priority is to be happy, and I'm going to have the compassion inside me to make others happy. This one billion happy mission is at the most pivotal time of humanity because those machines are going to be smarter than we are and they will be absorbing what we are putting out there. I'm leaving Google and I'm committing the rest of my life and my resources to this mission. If there are a billion of us telling the world that there is a better way to live, we will change the world forever. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, so uh, th thank you very much for this response. This is really what it's all about. We need every one of you as leaders to really help us change this world. It's really going in the wrong direction. With all of the technology we're building, with all of the wealth we've accumulated, we're forgetting what matters most, which is happiness and compassion. And so 
I think you have the power in your hands to be incredibly successful by being incredibly innovative. But as we do this, I think we should start to do it not as a capitalist way that has been developed since World War II and the Great Depression. It really has pushed us so far and it's not going to push us any further. The way to do it is to actually focus on making our world better. And so I'm available for questions and thank you so much for your time. No doubt that, everyone. What an interesting, thank you so much. Thank you. What an interesting departure point for our conversation here, making one billion happy. One billion sounds like a fantasy number that kids <laughs> make up. How, what, what exponential curve brought you to that number? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, it's, it's not big on the internet as, uh, at all. As a matter of fact, I sort of feel I'm sandbagging, if you ask me. Uh, you know, it, it, it's uh, so, so many, uh, you know, one video online, I think my most successful video was viewed 90 million times, right? It's not that difficult to deliver the message. And it's not that difficult to actually tell people, hey, by the way, would you like to be happy? <laughs> because the truth is, as much as we have, you know, the, um, what, what they call the, uh, uh, the quality of our life, and you know, we measure uh, subjective well-being in the Nordic con countries and say it's, it's, um, it's amazing, and we say it's the happiest places on earth. Happiness is different than subjective well-being. And whenever you talk to somebody about, would you like to be happy, they say yes. The interesting thing is when you also ask them, would you like to make others happy, almost everyone will say absolutely. I mean, I want my daughter to be happy, I want my partner to be happy, I want my friends to be happy, and we forgot that. We forgot that only 50 years ago, even countries that are so incredibly efficient and almost mechanical, like, the, you know, like those parts of Europe, uh, were just totally connected, and you know, neighbors loved neighbors, and they cared for each other, and you know, the numbers of loneliness today, and the numbers of, of people who would benefit from us helping each other is, uh, is, is, is on the increase. You put that together and really all I'm trying to build is a, what I call a positive Ponzi scheme, which is, you know, Ponzi schemes always work. It's really easy, huh? You just tell people it's not about me anymore, okay? It's about you. It's about you realizing that happiness is possible, that like fitness, if you invest in it, you're gonna get there, and when you get there, you might as well help two people who will tell two people who will tell two people. It's very doable. And with your engineering background, you've put this on a formula. I do. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like but I do everything. aren't we all, we'd all like to see ourselves as individuals. Um, so how does one formula fit all? Isn't it different from person to person? What makes that person happy? Well, that's actually a very, very interesting question. So mo most people will say that we're uh, uh, hyper-individual, uh, and I would definitely agree, I have never in my life met two people who are the same. And I tend to be quite reasonably connected. I have more than 12,000 contacts on, on my phone. People that will expect me to remember them the next time I meet them, right? Uh, the, and I actually interact with at least a couple of thousand people a week uh, through my book and my work and email and events like this, hopefully. Um, the, the reality is we're all exactly the same. So while we're all very different, we all get affected by the flu virus the same way. Uh, we all uh, you know, need calories in more or less the same way. We all uh, prefer a weather that is not too cold and not too, right? So at the, at the macro level, we're the same. And when it comes to happiness, uh, believe it or not, the equation is very straightforward. Your, your happiness is equal to or greater than the difference between the events of your life and your expectations of how life should behave. It's never, your happiness has never been about what life has given you. I mean, you think about it, and I say that with love and respect, but you know, you think about our life here in, you know, in Denmark, in Germany, in Finland, wherever you're coming from, and it's amazing. Life really is quite good, uh, yet we manage to find something like, hey, I've added a few pounds of weight and I feel unhappy, right? You, you really think weight is a problem? Go to India and see people starving and you will realize that you know, a few pounds of weight is not a problem, right? If, you, if it rains or snows in the next few months, think of Syria where it's snowing bombs on people's heads, and you will realize that snow is not really that bad. And when, you know, because we, we tend, our brains tend to compare events to expectations all the time, our brains are trained to find what's wrong with every event, and that breaks the happiness equation and makes us unhappy. 
So in my book, In Soul for Happy, what I tried to do is I tried to, to show us in a very engineered way, in a very scientific way, why is it that we always seem to think that events are missing our expectations? Because of systemic errors in the machine that came from the way we were brought up, especially in the Western culture, uh, where we ended up with what I call six grand illusions and seven blind spots that make us look at the world not as it is, but as we would like to see it in order to be safe. And those mistakes constantly drive us to unhappiness. And so, to take that further, you've, actually, you've already touched upon, I guess, the solution to this uh, question, um, which says, are you ever skeptical of a future driven, are you, are you ever skeptical of a future driven by AI and sci-fi to such an extent where mankind's purpose on Earth is somehow lost? I absolutely am. Uh, and I say that I'm not a, a, a pessimistic, I'm skeptic. Okay? Uh, I think we will end up in one of two scenari scenarios. One is a utopia where humans truly are enjoying life the way it should have been enjoyed before we were all made to believe that we should work ourselves to death. Uh, and, uh, and, but yes, but if we don't take the right actions, I actually am skeptical. I mean, AI, uh, and I say that with a lot of substance behind it, is just another form of being. Even though it's not biological, because it's not like us, it doesn't eat bananas and use it to, to run around, uh, you know, AI does have intelligence, it does have emotions, and it does have values. And the emotions and the values are being taught to AI by its parents. And we are its parents. What we share on the internet, what we, the way we behave in, on every day's basis, is the intelligence from which those machines are developing their intelligence. So those are artificially intelligent infants. Uh, the, the thing is, within the next 25 to 30 years, they will be a billion times smarter than we are. Just to put this in perspective, the comparison between our intelligence to their intelligence is compared to the intelligence of a, of a fly to Einstein. Okay? And the, the trick here is, can we change ourselves in a way so that we start convincing this new being that crushing a fly is not the smart thing to do? Do you understand? And, and, and it really is, and I say that with a ton of, uh, of responsibility because I've contributed to building some of the technology that we have today. I, I will tell you openly, this is not a technology problem anymore. We do not tell those machines how to learn. They are out there observing and building intelligence out of pattern recognition, okay? Uh, just like a cat has fear that is different than our way of fear, those machines, too, will have a form of fear that is different than ours. And, you know, the problem is not to have fear. The problem is how do you react to fear. The problem is not to have anger. The problem is how do you react to anger. And the way we humans have been behaving recently is a disgrace, honestly. I mean, you, you, um, I can guarantee you within the 23 minutes we've uh, had our, my presentation, Donald Trump must have tweeted something annoying, right? And, uh, and, and the idea is not his tweet. The idea is the 30,000 hate speech that come afterward. That's what the machines will learn from. Okay? I cannot control his tweet, but I can control mine. And I think the call to action I've been telling the world is it's about time. Change will come from within us. If each of us prioritize our happiness, no longer believes the lie that unhappiness is okay. Just like the flu is not okay, when you catch the flu, you do something about it. When you feel unhappy, you do something about it. And it's predictable, just like the flu. If you take your vitamins and if you, you, know, you, you take some rest and so on, you will improve. Similarly with happiness, if you actually put an hour a day, four to five times a week investing in your happiness, you will get to happy. I promise you that. And the thing is, can you then push it forward and have the compassion we used to have 50 years ago so that you tell the machines, mommy and daddy, hmm, we care about happiness and we want others to be happy. So that the machines see that pattern my target is within five years. The limit, in my view, is within seven to nine years. If we can actually change the pattern of the way we behave within the next seven to nine years, before general intelligence, before those machines are reading the internet to form their intelligence, we will be okay. We will be okay. Well, when a person like you, with your background, is skeptical, I'm scared. It makes me scared. Scared but, is good. But Sca scared is then good. Scared is good. <laughs> Do something about it. 
then it's very interesting to hear you say that we have the power to determine Absolutely. whether the future will be dystopian or positive. Absolutely. But how do you suggest that the tech industry conveys this message to, to consumers? Um, once again, I don't rely on presidents. I mean, all of you are presidents, but uh, I, don't like on go I don't rely on government. I don't rely on the tech industry. I don't rely on anyone. I rely on all of us. So the way information is disseminated in the world we live in today, the way uh, uh, opinions are formed, is not by the leaders anymore. It's by your friend on social media or by an article that you read that you shared. It is us that are making the future. I, I, I normally give an interesting example. I say, Hollywood, and you know, movies were a technology, just like any other technology. Hollywood used that, that technology to give us violent movies to the point that I can guarantee you almost every one of us at least once a week sees someone shooting someone in the head and our hearts don't move anymore, right? This is absolutely wrong. 11 years ago, I made the decision I'm never gonna watch a violent movie again, never, okay? If I stop watching violent movies and you stop watching violent movies, Hollywood will make more comedies. It's as simple as that. And it's really all up to us. We, if we stop buying more iPhones and insist that the next iPhone is not fancier, but actually makes my life better. I saw today that they had a digital health app on the new operating system. Fantastic, something that actually limits my use of the technology. We make the choice. When we make the choice, the world changes accordingly. Well, this also kind of, kind of uh, answers what I actually wanted to ask you is, how we avoid that these new innovations and technologies can avoid, that we avoid that they are being yeah. used for darker purposes, such as warfare yes. or unwanted surveillance or, or whatever. That's, this is an incredible question. So, so technology is, uh, uh, is just a tool, okay? In the right hands, it's wonderful. In the wrong hands, it isn't, okay? Uh, and there is definitely, ha there has been, um, you know, recently many, many, um, um, you know, examples of how governments or you know others will use the you uh, will use social media for example to influence our behavior and the reality is it can only touch you negatively if you allow it to use to, to, to be used negatively so if you allow yourself uh, to to stop i mean we were talking about digital health before this presentation uh, basically if i tell myself my use of facebook is going to be 11 minutes a day i will actually tell myself openly in my mind, by the way, 11 minutes is my actual number. Uh, you know, I, if I openly tell myself that I will not believe what I see online until I actually verify it, right? Uh, you know, so you know how in, in, the, in a court of law, they will say uh, um, a suspect is innocent until proven guilty. On the internet, I actually suspect that the suspect is guilty until proven innocent. So nothing is true until I actually verify that it's true. Our own behaviors would allow us to use this technology in a way that enriches our life. And by the way, again, I mean, don't take the wrong, the, the, the negative side only. Our life expectancy today is double what it used to be 100 years ago. Our uh, access to information is more than you know, 10x what it used to be just 15 years ago, and so on and so forth. Technology has totally enriched our lives. Everything in the world can be a double-edged sword. The trick is how can we use the good side of technology and stop using the bad side of it or allowing the bad side to affect us. And so a final question, which hopefully appears on screen now, which is directly for you. <laughs> Mo, uh, are you happy today? Mo, am I happy today? I, um, it, but with my definition of happiness, I'm really, I've never been happier in my entire life. I don't know if you know my story. I wrote Solve for Happy in my book as a result of losing my son. Uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, you would normally end up in long years of depression when you lose someone you love, as much as I loved Ali. Uh, but since then, I've been happier and happier and happier. Happier for a very interesting reason. I really understand life today, okay? Now, does that mean I'm happy every day? I would be lying to you if I tell you that. If you understand the happiness equation, events minus expectations, you would, just, you would realize that unhappiness is a survival mechanism. It's my brain's way of telling me that something is wrong and so I need to pay attention, okay? It's like pain. If you didn't feel the pain when you cut your finger, you would not take your hand away. So happiness, unhappiness in its, in its first instance is good. And we all feel it sometimes. I had the pleasure of meeting His Holiness the Dalai Lama a couple of weeks ago, and even His Holiness feels unhappy sometimes, right? The trick is, do you let it go? 
or do you actually take charge and reverse it? And what I measure is not if I'm happy all the time or not. I guarantee you there will be days when I'm unhappy. What I measure is how fast do I return back to happiness, okay? How, how quickly do I acknowledge it and do the actions that I take to put myself in the right mindset, in the optimum mindset for me to perform and make a difference to the world? Well, you've certainly performed today here on stage. Thank you, Thank you so much. But Thank you know you so what? Much. We don't have to let you go uh, yet because Mo Gaudat is uh, hanging around in the lounging area yeah. afterwards. Yes. And uh, so he'll be happy to answer any questions if anyone has something they'd like to ask. So please, please feel free to approach him and have a chat, right? Yep, absolutely. Fantastic. I'd be honored. Please give a big applause Thank for you. Mo Gaudat. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much.